Thank you for joining the CGU Career Development Office for this webinar on kickstarting your career. Uh, my name is Christine Kelly. I'm the Director of Career Development, and I'm joined by... I'm Lee Schroyer, uh, outreach, Employer Outreach Coordinator and Internship Coordinator. Right. So um, what we're going to do in this webinar is help you learn about things you should do to start planning your career. Um, I realize that we have people in the audience that are at different uh, stages. Some of you are brand new, just trying, just starting your time at uh, CGU. And I realize some of the folks that are um, scheduled for this or have been here for a little while. So no matter, or even you might be changing careers. So no matter where you are in the process, if you're just starting out or if you're advanced and transitioning, there's still information and this can help you <coughs> figure out how to make a really good plan. And so that's just something we want you to know. And then also we work with you to help to individualize your uh your plan to your particular needs. And so when you meet with us individually, it's going to be very tailored to your particular needs. And so I just want you to know that um, as well. So first thing you need to do is to <coughs> do some career exploration, sorry. <coughs> some career exploration and some visioning. And so this should be a really fun part of your process, the part where you think about all of the possibilities that are open to you without considering any limits. At this point, you don't want to put any parameters about it. Just kind of think ideally in a, in a great world where you can pick whatever you wanted to do and money wasn't an object, what would you do? Uh, this is also a time when you should start working on your growth mindset as it relates to your career. So um, if that's a phrase that you're not familiar with, having a growth mindset means that you believe your most basic abilities can be developed through dedication and hard work, that brains and talent are just a starting point. Um, and this creates a, a love of learning and resilience. It's essential for a great accomplishment. And also resilience is a key to your job search because there actually is a lot of rejection that you'll have to face. And so the more resilience you can build up, the better it's going to be um, so that you will realize that once you get to that final goal and you get the job, everything will, you'll forget how bad it was to get there. Um, and so we'll talk about that and how to work on that in your career planning process. So being in graduate school is a really transformative experience. And we, you should really think of graduate school not as just going to courses. Um, there, you need to start planning your career at the beginning of school. So there's a lot of things you can start learning about and exploring as you're uh, entering your program and you're working through your program. First, uh, what do you want to do when you finish your program? Um, uh, you also want to look at what titles, what job titles interest you. Um, what you need to do in graduate school to reach the goals you want to get to and the career plans you had when you started graduate school. You know, those may need to adjust, but what were they when you started? You need to look at where and how to find the job openings that you typically want and how to develop the strategic relations you need to enter that profession. Mm -hmm. This is all a time for exploration. You want to look at all of these pieces as you're entering school and think about them as, during your uh, college career. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I want to talk about also is like career plans that you had when you started graduate school. Um, graduate school is a very transformative experience. And when you come here, you know you're coming here to learn some new things. And you might have a pretty good idea of how you define yourself now and what would be a good fit for you. But in two years or plus from now, that could change very dramatically. So you also have to be open to the fact that even if you think you have a really set plan now and you know exactly what you want to do, you are going to be a different person when you leave here. And the plans that you made before you came here might not be the ones that work for you when you're on the other side of the process. So career planning is always needs to be flexible and it's always an iterative process as well. So um, some of you might say, I'm going to do this exact thing. And when you get out, you do that exact thing. But a lot of you might find that you change quite a bit in graduate school. And that's a good thing because you should not be the same person when you finish as you were when you started. 
Um, so there are different ways that you can work to figure out who you are. And so I wanted to introduce a couple of those to you. So one of them is called Imagine PhD. And this is a, sub, a site, even if you're not a PhD, don't let that freak you out too much. It, it works for anybody. But a couple of the tools they have in there that I think are really helpful will help you to figure out what you need to experience, what experiences you need to have, what skills you need to develop, what interests you have, and what values they have. So there are assessments in Imagine PhD that help you work look at your skills, your interests, and your values. There are a wide variety of assessments. That's just one I happen to like it because it is key towards and, and specifically created, especially the skills part, based on things that you learn in a graduate program, which some of the other ones don't. Um, interests and values, there's a lot of different ways you can figure out those, but that does become a good part of the piece. And so you need to give some thought to that. And even when you think about what your career plan is, your experience and your skills are going to be the biggest determinants in where you can go first once you leave graduate school. Um, employers tend not to pay all that much attention to degrees as much as they do to the skill sets that you bring and the experiences that you've had. So that's part of what you need to think about. Um, and there are other ways, if you happen to be a more creative person and don't like lists of things, there are other ways to figure out how to um, define yourself. So there's a process called mind mapping. Um, there's a, an example of mind map in the career roadmap document that lives on the CDO webpage. So you can find that. Um, but basically, it's important to just really give some thought to who you are, how you want to be in the world, the impact that you want to make. Um, and those will help to drive your career plan. And, you know, to add a little bit to that, even Though you maybe, if you're continuing your education or you're looking for a career transition, even in career transition, you may want to look at those because you're entering a new field. So you don't know what the opportunities might be in that new mm -hmm. field. Yeah, that's very true. And I'll have an example I'll give about that later. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So again, um, good questions to ask yourself um, would be... Um, what do I want to do? So that's a needs assessment. So how, how do you want to make an impact? And what do you want to do? What industry or industries best fit your needs? There's a bunch of different areas. And fun the difference between functional area and industry is an important one. So an industry is something like Lee and I are both in higher education. Before that, Lee was in franchise, franchise management, management for 20, 25 years. Right. Yeah. Um, other people are in different industries. And then the functional area is what you do within that environment. So in higher ed, I have been faculty and now I am staff. So I've had two different roles in the same industry. And for my process, when I started to transition and think of what I wanted to do besides faculty, my first foray, I started looking at things that were in a completely different industry, um, a variety of different industries, in fact. And I realized that I really like to be in higher ed. So I limited my search to things that fit within an industry. I'm also looking at different job titles that are of interest to you. There's a whole bunch of jobs you've never heard of. Um, and so sometimes a job description also doesn't really reflect what the job mm -hmm. is. So reading descriptions of what they want you to do will help you figure that out. Uh, what skills do I need to enter this career? Every career has particular skills that are a must have and some that you can develop along the way. And knowing the difference between these are the things that are the price of entry versus these are the things I can uh, build on later. And then again, knowing what the market demand is for the type of skills that you have, the type of jobs that you want, and whether or not that fits with the other things that you consider, like your geographic location and the like. Um, yeah, I have a fun example about the market demand. Uh, it was showing, the statistics were showing that industrial organizational psychology was one of the largest growth industries because it was supposed to grow by 45% in the next 10 years. Uh, do your research because I looked into it. There's only 700 positions in IO psych across the country. So mm -hmm. you're growing 300 job positions within 10 years. So make sure you, you do your research on what the market demand is yeah. for your field. <laughs> well, that's interesting too, because some places you look, so we'll talk about research later, but you have to be careful. And because I remember um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics a couple of years ago put out a report saying that faculty positions were going to be um, 
plentiful. <laughs> um, that wasn't true in 1986, the yeah. first time people said that. And then this one was in in the somewhere in the late 2000s. And so I looked at it and said, yeah, that's not correct, Nack. Yeah, I didn't so take I'm, into account Double that, check. <laughs> you know, people are teaching a lot longer. Yeah. So when you're looking at the goals you want to set for yourself, you really want to make sure that they're smart goals. When you start, really look at what results do you want and be specific about those. But the long, like Christine was saying on the earlier slide, make them very broad goals first and not, not necessarily well-defined. These are what are known as outcome goals. So they're, uh, one example I have is a personal example. I wanted to implement positive initiatives in companies, increasing team member well-being. So that's not a very specific goal. So then after that, you set up these SMART goals, where they're action-based, they're realistic, and they're time-bound, that are going to lead up to those broader, long-range goals. And by having time-bound, smaller sub-goals, you'll know you're making progress towards those larger goals down the road. And then even smaller than that, what specific activities or tasks we need to make those happen. And then even knowing what's, again, what's a short-term goal and what's a stretch goal. I mean, sometimes the what you want to do, like let's say you want to be a president of a university, um, that's on a job you get out of grad school. <laughs> and so there, what are the steps in between to get mm -hmm. to what your ultimate goal is? And so that's um, how starting to think about these things and really making those goals is really helpful. Um, so now we move on to the section on doing research. And so one of the things that you'll get good at in graduate school, or if you're already in graduate school, you're getting good at, um, is how to conduct research. And so you can hone your research skills in your career and exploration search process. So when you begin researching career opportunities, what you're going to find is that there are a lot of careers that you didn't know existed. And so here's what I'm going to tell my story. So when I was looking for positions in higher ed, I was just applying for things that thought would be a good fit for me. And one of the positions I found was doing career counseling with undergraduates. And I thought, heck, I can do that. Um, so I applied for the job. And then I got a phone call shortly after from the person who later became my boss um, telling me about an upcoming position that was the same job, but that was working with graduate students. So I didn't even know that was a thing. I mean, being a career counselor for graduate students, that I knew about. But I'm thinking somebody does that with grad students. I'd never met anybody who did that. I didn't know it was a job you could possibly have. So even when you think about your exploration, you might come across things that could be a good fit for your skills, for your interests, what you want to do. Um, that you didn't know existed. So when you research, you actually need to dive deeper down than those things that everybody knows, doctor, lawyer, faculty, mm -hmm. those types of things, because there's a lot of really interesting stuff that you might find um, just doing some research. So when you do research, you want to formulate research questions. So how am I going to become competitive? That's important to know. Um, can I get my preferred position right after CGU or might it take a little while? Uh, what specific companies or organizations do I want to target? Um, again, and there are criteria that you might want to think about that. Um, what's the hiring cycle? And this is really key. We I work with students who want to become faculty and some who want to become consultants, and they have very specific and very tight timelines for searching. If you want to apply for tenure track jobs, 99.9% .9 of those happen in the fall of the year before you want to be employed. And for consulting jobs, they do all their hiring in the fall and they know that you're not going to start in the summer until the summer. But if you miss that fall hiring cycle, there is no other opportunity for another year um, to try consulting yeah, again. The, the major companies, the big ones, when you think of management consulting, they're all doing their uh, college visits and their interviews in the fall. Mm -hmm. And they actually make their decisions in January for the next Summer, so you miss right. that cycle, you're you're out. Yeah, you need to know. Um, how what does a hiring process look like? How long does it take? Again, sometimes things take a really long time. Uh, most faculty jobs, your applications are going to be due in the early fall, but odds are they're probably not going to interview you until 
um, early spring or well, late winter, early spring. Uh, and then there's a phone interview first, then there's an on-campus interview, and then all teaching them like a whole bunch of stuff involved in that interview process and same with other industries i've worked with students who've had to do presentations who've had day-long interviews for industry positions so it's not just faculty who do that so you really need to do the research and find out yeah um, uh, one of the other government positions take oh, a very true. very long time to get through uh one of our students was started the process and finally got an offer six months later because there's a lot of background checks mm -hmm. and there's a lot of steps government organizations have right. to go through. Right, and we have someone who just passed her final screen, her final interview, and now they move on to the next part where they do the background check, which takes six months. And so she yeah. gets to hang around for six months waiting to hear if she gets the offer. Mm -hmm. um, and where do you find positions different? I mean, there are very specific job boards sometimes where people advertise things. There are also a bunch of jobs that are never advertised, and we can help you figure out how to find those um, also. Um, who do I need to know to get the job? Connections are always handy, and we have webinars on building strategic relationships, so you can work on that. Um, is my LinkedIn profile optimized to attract the right interests? A lot of recruiters actually use uh, LinkedIn to search for passive candidates. They like to pill for people who already have jobs somewhere else. Um, and then what salary can I expect? And so you need to go know going into it. Um, sometimes when I talk to students who want to be faculty, they're a little surprised mm -hmm. that those jobs don't pay more because it takes a long time. It costs a lot of money to get a PhD, but they don't pay phenomenally well. Um, and depending on your field, you need to know what you can realistically expect for um, your salary. So it's important to give thought to these types of things and really think, you know, what do I want to do? How do I want to be? And so these research research questions should help with that. So there, there are a lot of different resources you can use to research uh, what positions, what skills you're going to need. There are different online options. Uh, there's the Occupational Outlook Handbook online. ONET is a great resource that's sourced from all the national jobs. It's from the uh, government job job board. It shows all the skills that people in specific uh, positions need to have, what technology they use, and they can give you salaries. Um, like Indeed can also give you some salaries, and also uh, different positions that are open. One of the other resources uh, is Glassdoor. Yeah, Glassdoor is really helpful to get, that you can get, can get some self-reported salaries from organizations and salaries on specific positions. You can also get uh, feedback on what the culture is like about in those organizations. Um, you can get reviews of them. You can get what interview questions those companies use um, another one is uh, payscale.com and another one's called salary.com. But those, you can get very specific on what job title in organizations and what geographical region, because they're going to pay different in LA than they will in Nebraska or Arizona, we'll say. Um, but one of the biggest things is to talk to people that are in those organizations. Like Christine was mentioning, Strategic relationships are going to be key to um, part of your network that you build out while you're here. So you have the option to go to not just our events, but events at all the seven C's. And even though they may not be necessarily recruiting for your specific degree at one of those other univers universities because they're looking at undergrads, you can still talk to the people and they can refer you to the people that would uh, be talking to or hiring graduate students. Also engage with the campus speakers, the people that Saikai brings out, the companies that we bring out to talk to students. Engage with them, you know, try to do informational interviews, find out about their company, their organizations. You never know what type of possibilities are available. Uh, like I was saying, conduct in, informational interviews. I think one of those most successful women that we've had or I knew about from a cohort before me had a goal of setting, of doing 60 inter, informational interviews 
during her career uh, at Claremont Graduate University, and she got a job immediately when she graduated. Some of the other things that we'll be providing or that you could set up for yourself are site visits or job shadowing with people. Just going there and seeing what they do on a daily basis. One thing that uh, I like to do and that you really want to think about is go to association meetings that are related to your degree. Personally, I still attend Association for Training and Development meetings and Professionals and Human Resources meetings. I do that because they are representatives of companies that like to hire our students. So you want to think about all these things as you're coming to CGU, not just your coursework. All right, so next thing is to plan and execute. So once you've completed your exploration process and you've done all your research, you should have the information that you need to create a plan and a strategy to complete that plan. And strategy is always important. <laughs> so um, again, back to using uh, the strategic planning tool and Imagine PhD, they have what's called a Gantt chart. And so they have different categories of skill sets that you want to develop, um, things that you need to do to get through your graduate program, or just a variety of different things. And then there's a calendar at the top and you can drag and drop things into your calendar. So it makes it really good. Um, I like it because it's very visual and I'm a visual person and it can also export stuff to your calendar. Uh, but there are different ways to go through that process of creating a plan. You can create yourself a career journal or make a roadmap. So we have a document called the, well, two documents, a career roadmap that's a regular career roadmap. And there's one that's faculty career roadmap if you're considering faculty jobs and I can kind of give you uh, a process of thinking uh, through the through what you're going to do, or what you need to do. And and I don't think, I think if you're a non-linear thinker, there are a lot of creative ways that don't require kind of daily, like I'm really bad with keeping calendar planners, especially mm -hmm. paper ones, because I'd always forget to look ahead. <laughs> so I have my calendars in a very different way up on a wall so I can see them because that's how I process information. Um, and as you're going through the plan, I mean, keep looking at something and exploring it until you get bored with it. You say, yeah, clearly that's not what I want to do. Uh, but we can also help you develop your plan. Make sure your plan is adaptable. There's lots of things that can get in our way as we're going through school and making these either entries into careers or career transitions. Uh, one of the things, I mean, as a personal example, I was returning to graduate school, so I had to make the people in my life aware of what that was going to be like, that you know, for two years while I was attending graduate school, I was not going to be very available. Uh, a lot of times I was going to either have my nose buried in a book or uh, being on my way or in classes. So, you know, I made sure that uh, my wife was understood and was supportive of that. And that's going to be important to you too. make sure those people around you are supportive of you because it's going to be a very challenging time in your life. Uh, Great growth opportunity, but it's going to be challenging. Uh, one of the things also to be adaptable on is you, you might not be ready for that job you want right out of graduate school. As an example, there was a, a woman that graduated from here. That her goal was to work at Accenture. She loved that company and had admired it for a long time. But right out of graduate school, she had to step into a transitionary role and worked there for a couple of years, and then she applied for Accenture afterwards. She just didn't have enough skills, and she didn't have the experience that Accenture was looking for, the work experience. Um, also, one thing, make sure you, you plan for your location that you want to be in afterwards. Um, I, Christine can attest that if you're looking for a faculty position and you want to be in Southern California, you're it's going to be very challenging, and it's going to be a lot longer finding that position you yeah. want. Yeah, and sometimes the thing you want to do doesn't exist in the place you want to live. Mm -hmm. So even when you think about that, like I live in Orange County. I work with some students down there when I was at UCI who wanted to work in the pharmaceutical industry, but that doesn't exist in Orange County. It exists yeah. in, in San Francisco area, Bay Area, and down in San Diego. So if you don't mind driving down to San Diego, <laughs> so you, you need to think about all these things. Or even with family, like if 
if you want to be faculty, but your family say like, we're not leaving California, that could be a challenge for you. So there are different things that you need to give thought to as you're uh, planning. Um, and you, know, you really need to think about how long it's going to take you to get the job you want. You know, a very short time is three months. An average time is probably about six months. And if you're looking to be a tenure track professor, you're going to be looking at three years. Or more. Um, three years is, this was a stat they put out a few years ago about the average number of times somebody went on the, the academic mark before they were successful. But there are a lot of people who don't make it even after three years. And mm -hmm. I've read cases of people, it took them 10 years. Um, and some actually end up adjuncting forever. So it's really important because I think sometimes people seriously underestimate how long it's going to take them. Um, and then there's a lot of stress and thinking, but I don't have six months until right. I need a paycheck. So right. plan accordingly, because at the time you'll be really engaged in that job search process and applying for jobs and trying to get interviews is the same time you'll be finishing up here, either writing a dissertation or mm -hmm. finishing maybe a master's thesis or a master's project. So you will have a lot to do and it will be very challenging. And you can help shorten those time frames by starting that work in the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, a tenure track professor, if you have some positions while you're working here, can really shorten up that time. Right. Um, so next stage, obviously, is to engage with us. So we've told you that it's going to be complex, it's going to be hard, but there's no reason you have to do it alone. Um, I do hate the cliche that people use, it takes a village to do whatever, um, but the fact is it actually does take a, t a village to develop and build your career. Um, that's what we're here for, is to be your village, to support you, to help you do the research, to help you if you get stuck on things, and to do all of the work that you need to do in preparing to make sure that you're a really extra strong candidate, so that hopefully you end up on the short end of only taking three months to land a position. I mean, I it would be ideal for, for that to be what happens that you graduate and then you take a little vacation and start your job right away. Um, so that happens with careful planning in advance. I have to say that, you know, from my observations here and the interactions with students, I've seen a major improvement the more interactions they have with our office. I, I was, like I said, I was in franchise management for 20 to 25 years. I have done, if not more than at least a thousand interviews and I'm really impressed with the improvement uh, from step to step as they engage more with us. Mm -hmm. what, there are, we have a lot of tools for you to use. Like we mentioned, the Imagine PhD. These are free re resources for you that you really need to take advantage of. One of them is another one's called Big Interview. And it's something I think is underutilized a little bit, but it has great tips on, the, especially on that first Skype or Zoom interview that is almost uh, every Inimitable. industry uses now. Um, they have some great tips on going through that you probably didn't think about. Uh, we have YouTube videos of all our webinars and some other tips on resume creation, CV creation, cover letter. Uh, we have a blog we put out about every week or two weeks uh, you want to pay attention to. And... You know, follow us on Facebook and our Instagram. Uh, I'm going out to different events that you might be interested in. And we have different uh, programs that we advertise on there that you might not see in other, other places. Mm -hmm. Please come to our workshops and our events. They're really designed to help you advance your career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Uh, here's some other resources that we have available for you in the portal. So we do have an MA and a PhD timeline that kind of lays out some of the things beyond your coursework and writing a dissertation or thesis that you have to do. Um, I mentioned the two roadmaps that we have. Um, you can also have a strategy session with us. So target your career interests, identify informational interview targets, um, develop your elevator pitch, which we also have a YouTube video on, um, or whatever you need from us. We're here to help you. So don't be afraid to ask. Um, come and see us uh, as much as you want um, and you keep these services forever. So even as alum, when you leave here, you still have access to services, which is a really important thing because sometimes I've worked with alum who are making career changes, you know, mid to late career. And it's always helpful to have somebody else that you can brainstorm and talk through things with. Um, so there's a lot that we can do for you. 
Um, I also wanted to let you know about the other webinars that are in this series that we're doing this summer. <clears throat> the next one coming up is called Preparing to Teach and Lead, and you can see the rest of them in the list. Um, all of them are listed on the Academic Professional Development website. Um, so if you just go into the portal, there'll be a banner right in the middle that says professional development. You just click on that. It will lead you to the site with a calendar and all of the links, all of those are in webinar format. Um, so we definitely hope that you will make use of those. They will all be recorded and the ones prior to this have also been recorded as well. So you can find those um, available most likely on that professional development site or in our case on the CGUCDO YouTube channel. <laughs> so... Uh, so again, we hope that you will come and see us. You can schedule appointments through Handshake. Uh, we are available both in person and remotely. So if you need to meet with us, but you aren't on campus a lot, that's totally fine. We do a lot of Zoom meetings with people and we can do the phone. Uh, so make an appointment with us and come see us. Um, if you don't see a time in Handshake that works for you, then email one of us individually and give us three days and times that you can meet. And usually we can find a place to put that in our calendar um, and make sure that you get the help that you need uh, when you need it. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I hope that we were able to give you a good viewpoint of what you needed to do to kickstart your career and help you'll start to implement some of these things and get your career uh, off to a, a blazing start. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in our office. Thank you.